Good morning, uh, Scott. It's about 7 a.m. in your city. And that is correct. And, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. I will read out a very short introduction, uh, and uh, we will then look forward to your keynote address, the international keynote address. Uh, Dr. Diru is the dean of the Stephen, uh, Stephen Ross School of Business at University of Michigan. Uh, he is award-winning researcher and instructor and is widely considered a thought leader in the business education and particularly in action-based learning domain. Uh, he's written for international media publications, including Bloomberg, New York Times, Harvard Business Review, Guardian, and the list is very long. So with this very brief introduction, may I request Dr. Scott DeRue to kindly deliver the international keynote address uh, on MBA pedagogy for the new era for the ninth Indian Management Conclave. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, and I'm, I'm uh, honored uh, to be able to be uh, able to join you uh, today and uh, to be part of uh, a truly esteemed uh, panel uh, discussion and want to thank all of you for coming together and really uh, working together to think creatively and reimagine what uh, business education could and should be uh, in the future. Uh, as the world around us changes, and uh, we uh, think about what the future of work and uh, what talent uh, uh, requirements will be in the future, we as educators must evolve how we think about business education. So it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you uh, today. I wish I could be there in person, uh, but it's great to, uh, to see what technology can do to bring people from all around the world together uh, in education and beyond. Uh, so thank you. Uh, my brief comments this morning uh, are motivated by uh, really two forces that I think are impacting business education globally. Uh, the first is what technology is uh, doing both in terms of disruption but also opportunity creation uh, in all sectors that have historically uh, traded on content. Um, if you think about publishing or music or in our case education, uh, what technology is doing, uh, both, again, to disrupt as well as to create opportunities, I think is quite remarkable. Um, if you think about uh, how we historically uh, purchased and consumed music, for example, uh, we used to buy albums, uh, and over generations they took different technological forms from uh, vinyl to CDs to cassette tapes, etc. It was not all uh, an album. And then iTunes came along and, and disaggregated that bundle. Uh, and then Spotify and Pandora and these other services came along and really democratized and uh, in some ways commoditized the content uh, and made it really accessible uh, to uh, many people around the world. And, it, and the music industry shifted away from content and very much to live entertainment and experience. And I think the same thing is happening in publishing. I think the same thing is happening in education. Uh, and so I think that's one uh, force that uh, we need to pay particular attention to is what technology is doing to the value of content and how we are shifting from content to experience organizations. Um, the second force uh, really is what's happening in the world of work. Uh, and that's where I'd like to start uh, to, uh, my comments uh, today, um, is really around what is the future uh, of work. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, being in uh, Dallas, Texas a couple of weeks ago uh, with a group of thought leaders who study the future of work globally. Uh, and uh, a few uh, data points came out of conversations that we had there in uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, that I thought I would share with you uh, today uh, as a way to enter into this conversation on what uh, the future of business education might look like. Um, so what is the future of work? And what is technology enabling uh, uh, us to do that is changing the demands for talent? Because at the end of the day, we as business schools, uh, in India you have roughly 4,000 business schools. Uh, in China you have 
I think a little over 600 business schools. Here in the US, I think we have less than 400 who are accredited. Uh, I believe there's about 12,000 around the world. Um, we all are suppliers of talent uh, to this world of work. And so we have to first understand what the future of work is and what uh, requirements on talent uh, will be. So what is the future of work? So here, here's a data point that uh, I, I learned here recently that I thought was particularly interesting, which is in the United States uh, alone, and, and uh, I'm collecting data globally on this now, and I, I, what I'm finding is very similar trends uh, across countries. Uh, but in the US, um, in a 10-year period from 2005 to 2015, 94% of net employment growth in the United States occurred in what we call alternative work arrangements. Uh, so think freelance, think uh, gig economy, think uh, employees that are off balance sheet, uh, contracting of various sorts. You combine that with uh, companies like an Uber. Uh, Uber owns no cars, uh, technically, uh, according to Uber at least, employs no drivers. Uh, yet is the world's largest taxi service. So who would have thought uh, just 10, 15 years ago that the largest taxi service uh, in the world would own no cars and technically have no full-time uh, drivers? Um, companies like Airbnb. Uh, Airbnb uh, owns no real estate, uh, yet is the world's largest hotel uh, and accommodation provider. What does that mean for the future of work and what talent has to be able to, uh, to do? Um, another data point, from 1970 to 2009, what we would call highly cognitive non-routine work, right? So the, not just white collar, blue collar, but the intellectual, non-routine, critical thinking, analytical skill-based uh, work grew by uh, 60%. Uh, but what we would refer to as repetitive work declined by 12. Uh, and that has significant implications for uh, routine work in uh, various business functions, whether it be accounting or otherwise. Um, but what's fascinating to me is many of these jobs that we would consider data-oriented jobs are becoming more human uh, than they've ever been before. Uh, so here's a, a, a study that was published uh, last year uh, looking at all of the jobs uh, posted uh, in the data science, data analytic uh, world. And what percent of those jobs, relative to all other jobs, require what you and I would call soft skills, problem solving skills, teamwork skills, creativity, etc. And surprisingly to some, the jobs that are more data science analytic jobs actually require those soft skills more so than your average job. Uh, and so we often think about the soft skills becoming less important to the analytical and data science skills, but that's actually not true. Uh, what we're seeing is those data science jobs uh, putting a premium on the soft skills. And that's further reinforced by companies like Google and many others, but I'm showing here the illustration of Google. Um, I had the privilege of uh, working with some Google folks when they were doing their Project Oxygen uh, and uh, subsequently Project Aristotle, which was really a project to understand what predicts success at Google. And uh, out of that came uh, 10 competencies, if you will, uh, that really predict success at Google. And interestingly, uh, nine out of 10, uh, so the number eight there that's highlighted, it is the only one that specifically references technical skills. Uh, and interestingly, it's the, having the technical skills so that you can coach or mentor uh, your team. All of the other uh, nine are very much about uh, managing and leading your team, uh, being able to work across the organization, uh, communication, coaching, decision making, et cetera. Uh, really about collaboration. And so I think this has a significant impact on what we as educators in business schools, how we think about uh, what we do. And that's what I want to talk about just briefly this morning to hopefully stimulate some ideas uh, that uh, uh, can find their way into the conversations that you're going to, uh, to be having as part of this wonderful conference. And so to prepare students for the, that future of work, 
Um, I think that we as educators need to be able to uh, do at least two things. Um, we need to be able to think about and reimagine how we teach, and we need to think about and reimagine when we teach. And so I want to talk about both of these uh, as part of our uh, conversation uh, and, and this conference. So I'll first talk about how we teach. And I'm going to go back a little bit in history to when business schools started. Um, here at the University of Michigan, our business school was founded in 1924. Uh, and so we're coming up on our 100th uh, year anniversary. We just celebrated our 200th year anniversary as a university. And for generations, uh, we had a pretty standard way of teaching. Uh, and it looked like this. Um, this is a picture of one of the first business schools in history. And it's the classic lecture uh, modality, uh, where the focus is really on the, 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 the wise expert in front of the room, what you and I would call the faculty member. Uh, and the faculty member is all-knowing, and uh, everyone in the, the class, our students, has the privilege of uh, soaking in and learning from our wise faculty member here. But what's interesting is the focus is on the faculty member. If you turn the camera around, uh, the image would look something like this, uh, where you have a group of students uh, sitting and listening and, and being very passive uh, in uh, how they are consuming that information. This is where we started as business schools. And then in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, schools like Harvard Business School and others begin to introduce a much more discussion-oriented form of learning, what you and I would call the case method. Uh, and so you had students uh, that uh, were still sitting in a classroom, uh, but instead of being passive uh, and consuming what the faculty, um, the, the wisdom of the faculty member, now it was a discussion about a case that had happened in, in uh, some time in history uh, or prior to that class, but it was really uh, uh, unpacking the critical thinking and problem-solving skills that are very important, uh, and it became a much more lively discussion-oriented form of education. And now, now what we're seeing um, is an evolution in that, um, that uh, is shifting um, the, uh, the how we learn beyond the case method, beyond the lecture method, um, to even a more active form of learning that is embedded in these real-world challenges and opportunities that companies are facing. Where students aren't simply reading about a case that happened in the past, but in fact students are the case. Students are the live case and they're learning as they're solving problems. So we call this the action-based or experiential learning that many business schools around the world are doing. But I think the evolution of how we imagine uh, business education and how people learn is going to be even more experiential and more global than it's ever been in the past. So here you see students uh, from the University of Michigan, the Ross School of Business, working for Microsoft. Um, and Microsoft has provided them a, a real business challenge uh, that they're working on. Um, here you see uh, our Michigan Ross students working in the mobility and autonomous vehicle uh, arena for Google. And we at Michigan are taking this to another level. We're reimagining what the business school or business education experience can and should look like all around the world. So here you see students in India this past year uh, working in healthcare, working in technology. We at the University of Michigan, what we're trying to do is create a portfolio of real world hands on education where every student starts real businesses, invests real money in real markets and assets, whether it be venture capital, real estate does consulting with real companies all around the world. And we've already even started building businesses inside the school that our students are running. And the whole premise is building this portfolio of experiences and action-based learning where 
we move from an environment where students are learning via case studies about other people and other businesses to a world where students are the live case study. And so we call this the living business model, where we build this collection of businesses. Again, startups, investment businesses, advisory consulting businesses, real operating businesses that our students are leading. And we started to build this over the last five years and really beginning to scale it. So in the last five years, our students have started over 170 companies uh, with over $100 million of venture funding coming to those businesses. And it's all part of the curriculum. It's not something that they're doing extracurricular, but it's all part of the curriculum. It's embedded, both undergraduate and graduate. On the investment side, we now have uh, seven. This year we'll have eight investment funds. Uh, total now is about it's about 12 to 15 million dollars uh, US dollars under management. Uh, venture capital funds, real estate funds, impact investing funds. Again, all part of the curriculum where we're actually teaching our students how to make investments, how to do due diligence, using real capital with real investments, bringing in our alumni from around the globe to serve as investment committees, and it's all part of the curriculum. Uh, this year we'll do about 200 consulting projects, advisory projects in about 25 countries. And it's a required part of the curriculum for every program that we have here at the school. So our MBAs, for example, spend a full two months at the end of the first year. Uh, we shut down all other classes uh, and for two months they work in teams of five or six students, two faculty per team, and we partner them up with uh, uh, with companies all around the globe, about 40% of projects are outside the U.S. Uh, across these 25 countries. And for two months full time, uh, they're taking all the knowledge that they learned in the core uh, business school experience and applying that across functions to solve real problems for companies like Microsoft, Google, Oracle, etc. I always tell people if we charged BCG or McKinsey prices, we might not, not have to charge tuition. Uh, but, uh, you know, here we, here we are. Um, and, uh, and then lastly is we have this portfolio of student-run businesses across a, a diverse set of sectors. We, we launched a luxury goods company this year uh, that uh, got to market uh, with a product for the, uh, for the holiday retail season this past year uh, that's doing really well. We've got a job placement and training service. Uh, we've got a couple of social enterprises. Um, we've got a technology and media company. Um, but again, these are all student-run businesses. And so what I'm trying to illustrate is just like what's happened in music, where the content has really become a commodity and the concert experience, the live entertainment became the premium. I think the same thing is happening in business schools, where we're moving from the base content that we would traditionally learn via lectures, maybe through some passive case studies. Uh, we're now moving where uh, our concert experience is having students start businesses, invest in businesses, advise businesses, and lead businesses, what we call this living business model, uh, and really pushing our innovation uh, in that area. So that, I think, is a really fundamental shift in how we teach. Um, I think we also have to rethink as business schools when we teach. And so I'll spend just a, a few minutes thinking about when we teach uh, this is a global picture of where these action-based learning experiences are. You'll see in India, uh, relative to all other countries except maybe Europe combined, India is our largest market for doing these projects. But what we've been discovering is that our students, as global as they are, um, they they, they don't start learning when they come to us. They've been learning throughout their lives, and they certainly don't stop learning when they leave us. And what they're hungry for is for the University of Michigan and the Raw School of Business to help them grow, learn, and develop, not only when they're in school here, uh, but uh, throughout their lives, and no matter where they are in the world. And I think that's a real big opportunity for all of us you know, working in business schools today is to really think deeply about when we educate. Uh, because again, learning does not start when our students arrive on campus. I'm about to welcome back 4,000 students here to the business school uh, in the next couple of weeks. 
Their planning didn't start, uh, or doesn't start when they arrive on campus, uh, but it's, and it certainly doesn't end when they graduate. Um, but that's how we've had traditionally treated a business school student. Um, for inspiration on this concept that I'm about to talk about, I would encourage you to visit uh, Stanford's uh, 2025 project. I've given you their website here, uh, and uh, one of the um, uh, terms that we've uh, started using is called the Open Loop University to describe this concept. So traditionally, here's how we think about a business school student. Um, you're an undergraduate. You come for four years to an undergraduate program. You come to an MBA program. It's a two-year experience. Maybe it's a one-year experience in certain MBA programs around the globe. Um, and then maybe you come to an executive education program. Maybe you don't. Um, and it's very transaction-oriented pricing. Uh, here's what it costs for a four-year degree, here's what it costs for an MBA, here's what it costs for an executive program, uh, and you're in, you're out. It's a very defined uh, experience, defined point in time, um, very life uh, career stage oriented. I think over the next decade, um, maybe less, we're going to see some really innovative designs in higher education that take this very transaction um, uh, uh, way of thinking about education and shifting it to a much more organic, on-demand platform uh, that really redefines the relationship between school and student. So for example, um, you could imagine an undergraduate experience where you come to uh, school for a couple of years, then you leave school and go into some sort of co-op-like experience. Uh, before you even graduate, and then you come back with that experience to finish your undergraduate education. Uh, you can imagine the MBA experience, not only just moving to a, to a condensed version of the MBA, the one-year experience, but maybe it's leveraging your on-the-job experience much more intentionally uh, to leverage the learning value of the on-the-job experience that you have as part of your MBA studies. Uh, you could imagine um, uh, alumni coming back and teaching, not just to be able to come back and teach and provide uh, that resource for us as schools, but to actually accelerate uh, the learning for that alumni, uh, because we know the best way to learn something is to teach it. Um, you could imagine later in life, uh, as people start to near retirement, uh, that they're coming back and engaging with their university to do some experiments on what does a post-retirement look like now that people aren't really retiring to vacation, they're retiring to something different. Um, and so what might that look like? Um, this is all a way to say that the relationship uh, between student and university, I think, is systematically and fundamentally changing to where it's not you're in and then you're out when you finish this very defined point in time uh, degree program but it's an open loop where you're coming in, you're leaving, you're coming back, um, and it's a much more organic process where you're learning throughout your life. And what technology is now enabling us to do with these on-demand education platforms where pretty much anything in the business school is accessible uh, from a content perspective, is accessible anytime you want it, anywhere in the world, that's gonna open up so many opportunities for us to rethink what the relationship is between student and university in a way where we can meet uh, those learning needs, not just uh, when a student is 18 to 22 years old or 28 to 32 year old um, or an exec ed, but throughout their entire life on demand when they need it. Um, if we as business educators can shift how we teach to be much more experiential, much more action-based, the evidence is very clear. Learning, growth, and development will improve, uh, but it will also be more impactful, uh, not only for that student, but for the businesses that they're in, the businesses that they work with. And if we can rethink when we teach to really change the nature of the relationship between student and university to be less transactional and much more relationship-based where we're solving their learning needs throughout their life on demand. If we do those two things, um, I could not be more optimistic and excited about the future of business education uh, globally.
Um, and so that's what I wanted to share today uh, in hope that uh, it would motivate and inspire uh, a, a fruitful discussion on your end. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, it's a privilege. It's an honor. I wish I could be there in person. Uh, and if, uh, if I get to come next year, uh, hopefully you'll come back and, uh, and I'll get to meet many of you in person. Uh, so thank you very, very much for this opportunity.